Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another exciting edition of Biographic, the show in which I, Matt, the Game Boy, take you through the highs and lows of the Game Boy library, one cart at a time. And this one is a high note, folks. This is one of my favourites for the Nintendo Game Boy. It's Super Mario Land 3, Wario Land. Do you remember when video games were all about being a hero? It was all about saving the princess and sometimes the world in tandem, righting wrongs, and in some cases, taking justice into your own hands. It was all about good beating bad and the overcoming of evil being its own reward. Sure, you'd collect some coins and maybe a fancy sword along the way, but it really was all about the return to the status quo. Then came the 90s and the times were a-changing. So after their success with Super Mario Land 2 with the six golden coins, Hiroji Kiyotaka and his team of R&D 1 veterans were ready for the player to become a different kind of video game character. So in an unprecedented move, R&D 1 made the villain they'd created for the six golden coins into an anti-hero for the third Super Mario Land title, Wario Land. That's right, R&D 1 took a character obsessed with gold, power and his own well-being and made him the star of his own video game. Not only ousting Mario from his own portable series, but completely changing up the formula of one of the greatest Game Boy games of all time. This message was completely enforced by the game's American advertising that assured us that being bad and greedy was good. And this isn't just a PR angle either. Wario Land truly feels like a different game to your conventional Mario title. Though it's hard to deny the game's roots in the previous Mario Land outings. Wario is larger and intentionally full of bravado, with almost all enemies simply getting bowled over by Wario's bulky frame on impact. His power-ups feel dangerous and his love of gold is a key gameplay mechanic. The game's story really sets the tone, however. After being ousted from Mario's castle, Wario hears that the golden statue of Princess Peach has been stolen by the brown sugar pirates of Kitchen Island and hatches a plan to steal it back. Not to right the wrong, but to ransom it back and buy himself a castle. Throughout the game's 40 courses, the first thing that's going to grab you is the game's beautiful chunky sprites. Wario himself feels huge and imposing, making all of the game's initial enemies feel weak and empowering the player more than any Fire Flower ever could. Of course, as the game progresses, the enemies do become as large as Wario and are all beautifully animated. This does have a trade-off, however, that a lot of the game's backgrounds need to remain pretty simple. But as this game's enemies give so much character to it, it's one trade-off I'd make every time. The use of weapons for enemies on the offensive becomes established very early on, as Wario is simply able to put the boot to most of the first enemies you encounter and kick them so hard that all that remains is the content of their wallets. Using boomerangs, spears, and generally anything pointy, enemies will attempt to halt your progress, but simply wait for them to turn their backs or launch their weapon and you can drop kick them out of existence very easily. The game's bosses are naturally huge to impose on Wario and could be surprisingly tricky due to their breaking of traditional Mario conventions. Instead of jumping on enemies' heads a lot of the time, it's all about going under them and hitting them in the gut. Just the kind of cheap tactics you'd expect from Wario. Even cheaper still, a lot of these bosses actively encourage you to use Wario's power-ups. And man, are the power-ups in Wario Land good. It's honestly the first game I can remember where I was at a loss as to which power-up to take. As I mentioned, the regular hard-hatted Wario is a force to be reckoned with, allowing you to charge and stomp on top of enemies with ease. But then you have the option of strapping horns onto your head for a faster charge, and the ability to do what is now a staple of Mario's power-ups, the butt drop. But it doesn't end there. Wario has the option of strapping a jetpack onto his head to become Jet Wario and flying through the air at speed. But there's also a dragon helmet that shoots a twin jet flamethrower ahead of you. They are completely overpowered, but are just damned fun. Of course, it's tradition in Mario games, every now and again there's also a star power-up, but chances are you're not going to need it. Should you get hit, you will shrink to a tiny mohawked Wario, but it shouldn't be too long before you can pick up a bulb of garlic and return to your ever-imposing self. The real goal of the game isn't immediately obvious to the player, and that is collecting treasure. 
And by that, I don't just mean the in-level coins. Naturally, the pirates have other treasures that are worth plundering, and Wario is all about getting his. Hidden in select areas around the game are keys that can be used to unlock hidden doors within the levels. These 15 treasures can require some work on behalf of the player to get, but even when the key is right at the end of the stage, it never feels like too much of a chore to go back and collect it. But be warned, should you hit a game over screen, one piece of your pirate plunder will return to the vaults from which it came. But why is this more important than your average collectible? Well, chances are you'll beat the game without gathering them all. You'll get to Syrup Castle, defeat Captain Syrup's genie, and the golden statue of Princess Peach will be yours. That is until Mario shows up with a helicopter and steals it right from under you. First the butt drop and now this. What a scumbag that plumber is. Fortunately though, the most valuable item Wario got in his adventure from Syrup Castle, Mario didn't plunder, and that is the genie's magic lamp. So, with his eyes on the prize, Wario wishes for a castle, but being a pirate, the genie wishes for payment. The amount you give him will determine the size of the home he grants you, and for most players, this will mean you're probably going to get a hollowed out log in your first playthrough. But never fear, thanks to the game's save option, you can go back and play through the game's levels and rack up as much money as you can muster to try again. But if you beat all of the game's 40 courses, as well as collecting every coin and treasure in sight, Wario will end up with his own planet at the end of the game. So, as you can probably tell from the length of this video, I am in awe of Wario Land, and I have been ever since I got it for Christmas back in 1994, the year of the game's release. I could talk about the mini-games, the risk-reward factor of paying coins for a checkpoint and its hidden levels, but I don't want to rob you of the privilege of experiencing that for yourself. Because in my eyes, Wario Land is the greatest platform on the Nintendo Game Boy, and possibly my favourite game on the system. It's beautiful artwork, thoughtful level design, and it's freaking amazing score by Ryoji Yoshitomi and Kazoe Ishikawa should be a big part of even the most basic of Game Boy collections. Wario Land sold over 5 million copies worldwide, meaning it should be readily available if you want to play it. If you can't find a cart, you can also pick up the game at bargain basement prices thanks to the Nintendo eShop and the 3DS. And if this is your only means of playing it, I strongly recommend you do so. There is a reason this game spawned its own series and was able to drop the Super Mario Land moniker, so if you don't know what all the fuss is about, you need to get this game in your hands and give it a go. Because just like Greed, Wario Land is definitely good. And that brings us to the end of another boy graphic, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed. If you have, then please subscribe if you haven't already. And be sure to pass the channel on to others you think may enjoy it, because that's how it gets around. You should also check out some more biographic videos if you haven't already, where I look at the highs and lows of the Game Boy Library one cart at a time. Playing great games like this, but also playing crappy games so you don't have to. You can also check out some more Boy Curious videos, where I look at bootlegs and oddities for the system, as well as some All Glory videos, where I play through the game, cutting out all the deaths, leaving you with none of the faff, but all of the glory. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook at facebook.com forward slash biographic, as well as on Twitter at Game Boyle. Until next week, though, Game Boys and Girls, it's goodbye from me. Game on.